welcome to Wealth Well Done. Together, we'll cover a wide range of important topics surrounding money and the impact it has on our lives. From the sophisticated and highly valuable planning techniques of the ultra wealthy to the commonly underutilized biblical teachings. Together, we'll work to improve our relationship with money and our effectiveness in stewarding it well. Here's your host, Eric Scoville. Welcome to the 46th episode of the Wealth Well Done podcast. Um, we are excited excited for what we're uh, the conversation we're going to have today uh, with Gary Harps. And so, as, as we talk about the the pillars here of of the podcast, where we you know lean into these tactical, practical, and spiritual um, topics that can help you do your wealth well done, uh, I think today's today's going to be a treat here. So last week we had Andrew Barlow on. Um, he really leaned into the, I guess, two weeks ago into biblically responsible investing. And then the this past week was on how do you raise kids inside wealth. And now here this week, uh, it's a privilege to have Gary on. So Gary, thank you for joining us. Eric, I'm really looking forward to this. It yeah, be fun. <laughs> yeah no, same here. Um, so just a little a little background. So Gary, he's, he's, a, he's an accomplished entrepreneur uh, with three successful companies under his belt. He's a three-time author. Uh, with some books that I think bring a bring a high level of impact as well, and so uh, kind of like a, a main purpose of your work seems to be really you know the, this intersection of work and faith. Um, your latest book, Built to Beat Chaos, uh, you know, so it makes this biblical case that we are all created to overcome chaos, and I I'm uh, super excited to to dig into that more, and, and I think that's for anyone who hasn't already read your book, is you're probably going to. Uh, it's going to be a little bit of a mind bender um, today. So, so let's start with that, Gary. Can you give? Can you help us understand this built to beat chaos? What what is chaos? Because we all probably have a different definition of that. What is chaos, and 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 how is it biblical? And and apparently, it's not a bad thing that we're <laughs> we're all trying to avoid. But apparently, it's not a bad thing. So, let's start well, there. <clears throat> the first chapter of the Bible is. Uh, labeled Genesis, which is means creation. And in, in that chapter, about three quarters of the way through it, it mentions that we're, we are created in God's image. And it also says that we are um, created to have dominion or rule. And it, it uses different words. And it's a pattern all through scripture, clear to the end of the, the last book, that there's something about our design that is calling us into bringing um, ordering things, uh, building things, creating things. And what what struck my um, eye one time when I was reading this recently was that before I was, wrote the book was that about 25th or 6th uh, verse is where it says we're created in God's image. And I thought, well, what do we know about God at that point? He's telling us we're created like him. And in what ways are we like him? And I I went back to the beginning of the chapter thinking, well, all we know is what's written in these 25 verses. And the first thing I noticed, you know, most people I'll ask uh, sort of on the street interviews, you know, you say, uh, what's the first thing God created? And most people mull it around and they'll, they'll say uh, light. And that's what I would have said until this experience. What, what I noticed was the first thing God created, the very first sentence says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and they were void and without form. And it was kind of a counter, like you said, it kind of hits you in the face of, wait a minute, if God created it, it can't be bad. That's first thing. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, he's saying we are like him and he's telling us that he created chaos first. And then he started modeling for us what we are supposed to do, which is bring order out of that chaos. So we have a series of six pronouncements of um, let there be light or let there be you know animals, this and that and the other thing. So there'd be a pronouncement and some of the chaos would be used to fulfill that purpose. And that one insight just kind of turned my world upside down, beginning to realize See, I'm an engineer. I, I look at hammers, sees a nail, you know, everything's a nail. An engineer looks for design requirements <laughs> and looks for design. And what I saw in Genesis was the creator telling us our design requirement. We are built, we're designed to have dominion over chaos. And so really you can you can translate that very broadly that everything in life, in a sense, 
is taking some existing, something that already exists and repurposing it for a higher purpose. So you go, you cook a Thanksgiving meal, that is a form of bringing order out of chaos because the cupboard is full of ingredients and you don't know what to do with that chaos until you have a recipe. Right. Okay. <clears throat> I want to let that sink in, <laughs> not only for me more, but but for listeners here and and not move off of that too quickly. So chaos can be God ordained. And then yeah, 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 not can, it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Very, very, very point. So, so chaos is God ordained, backed by Scripture, and part. And 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 you know, it, it goes to the point of. I we often talk about this whenever we're having discussions on free will with with people, especially newer in their in their walk. That the so so we just got back from Hawaii, and um, all of the whales are there, and it's incredible whale soup they call it, and just. Our kids were getting bored of seeing the amount of whales breaching and this massive creatures, you know, doing these incredible things. And it was it's amazing. But all these all these whales are there. They they know to come this time of year, mm -hmm. and they're just programmed to know this. And mm -hmm. you look at any type of migration and how an animal, you know, a, a, a monarch butterfly can fly thousands of miles and all these incredible feats of nature, mm -hmm. feats of God, that that these animals are programmed to do this from the very beginning. Yes. Yet, with humans, it's different. And so when we're created in his image, we he has gifted us with this incredible gift of free will. He did not want us to be robots. Mm -hmm. And if he wanted this world to be robots, we wouldn't say, well, things, you know, well, life happens. Because we say life happens. And we, we talk about, like, no business. And we're going we're gonna to talk about entrepreneurs and chaos and how all this ties together here yeah. in a little bit. But, um, but the... You know, whether it's life or business or anything else, like we know that things don't just stay status quo. We know that things things don't stay orderly forever. They get messy. Relationships oh, happen. Yeah. And it's just all sorts of things happen that that cause our life to go back into some form of chaos, maybe, maybe more moderate than others at times, but mm -hmm. but to some form of chaos. And then what do we humans do? We go and try to bring order back to that. That's right. And what a gift it is, because we're we're not meant to just go through this life comfortable and easy. And that's some of the, we've had some great conversations with uh, a pastor on um, a few podcasts ago about Nathan or Nathan Rickner about you know we're not meant to live this just comfortable easy life. That's not what we're designed for. And so you bringing this into it is kind of it's building or or validating that that mm -hmm. the idea of there is going to be chaos that comes and it it helps give our life purpose. Uh, I couldn't agree more. And, um, you know, I didn't invent this. It's it's something I felt like God showed to me uh, one day when I was looking through this. And what what is interesting, so there, there's a, in the design world, there's design requirements, which says what you want something to do. And then there's design, which says, well, how do you put it together to do that? So Genesis does not really tell us what our design is. Genesis, that tells us what the requirement is. So we, we know at that point in, in the revelation that, that God intended for us to be creatures that uh, are able to overcome chaos. And later on in the story of Noah, there's a, a huge revelation in there in one sentence that tells us what our design is. And you've got um, you've got the designer standing there, analyzing his creature, his his creation, and saying, "Well, how's my my creation doing?" There's a there's a story about Monet. Um, you know, if it, Monet painting today would be worth untold amounts, millions and millions of dollars if you had all these paintings. And before one conference in Paris, he destroyed fifteen of his paintings. And you think that's insane, but he's the creator of those paintings. And so he's sitting there saying, these paintings don't satisfy what I intended for them to be. And therefore he destroys them. Well, here you have God, the creator of the universe, looking at his creation and say, well, I intended for these people to overcome chaos. And then he analyzes it. Here's in one sentence, he diagnoses what's wrong and he reveals our design in the process. He says the intentions, first of all, he observes that 
everything's evil. And then he says the intentions of the thoughts of their heart are only evil always. And so he tells us we have something called the intention. The word intention is the same word used when you shape a pot. When okay. a potter shapes a pot, that word intention means something has been formed in your mind. Some people call it the first creation. It's the idea you have that you begin to act on. You back that up and it says that intention came out of your mind. Your mind is the area of reason. And then heart is the area of desire. So you have this sequence. This God is giving us in one sentence an insight in the way he constructed us to have dominion. He gave us a desire engine called a heart. He gave us a mind to rule over the heart, to use wisdom and experience. Then he said, you imagine something and you either imagine something good or evil. Now we'll get into the definition of what that means in a minute. Right. And then out of that comes action. And of course the action informs your heart. I didn't get what I wanted. It, these things interact with each other all of the time. So what you have- beautiful. You have the designer declaring what we what's wrong with us, by the way. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say what a beautiful insight that that an engineer, it would take an engineer's mind to come up with that, to, to just to, to pull that out of scripture. Because you're right, it's right there. Yeah. But no, that's that's really good. OK. Um, well, so, so you mentioned a little bit about the, the good and evil part. I, I, I had there's a pastor. I'm going to come right back to that. There's a pastor who had talked. Um, I, I listened to some of his stuff on on hope and imagination. He talks about um, I, I have not gone and fact checked this, but he said every you know, when you see the word imagination in the Bible, it's normally talking about evil, and when you see hope, it's normally mm -hmm. talking about good. It's, it, you know, hope is always talking about good, but it's, it's it, mm -hmm. that's what he's saying that that hope is basically our imagination put to use in a in a godly way. And but when when the Bible talks about imagination, the word imagination, it's almost always referring to it in, a, in an evil sense. So you, yeah, well, the word I'm referring to here has to do with shaping things, and it's not, it can be good or evil, it, but it isn't. Sometimes we use the word imagination, it's intention. Um, okay. Intention. So we can have good intentions or not. And um, the, the interesting thing about evil. You know, there, there's some words you hear on the street and you think that's a church word, you know, like uh, uh, redemption and propiti propitiation or something. You think, okay, that's, uh, <laughs> that came from a church. And evil is one of those words that we sort of think um, has, you don't hear it that much um, other than in the church and sin. A sin is another one. And uh, But in reality, when those words were first used, they were just everyday words. And we've co-opted them to mean something that you only hear on Sunday. But the idea of um, sin and um, evil is simply that, like, you, you have an apple here, and that apple is in the integration of, back to my engineer speak, that apple is in the integration of many, many atoms. And you look at it and say, wow, that's a great apple. But eventually it rots. The, 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 the structure, the molecular structure of that atom begins to decay. The process of decay is called sin or evil. It's And it, it applies in any situation. So any designer, I build a car, eventually it will rust. Entropy will take over and it will rust. And so the intent of the original design is being thwarted. Scripture refers to that as oneness or unity. Uh, it's the same word we use for integer. And so when we're called to bring order out of chaos, we take a pile of two befores and build a house. So we took a bunch of separate things and build a single thing called a house. We take two people and we marry them and they become a couple. We take God is building the church and he one by one baptizes people in the spirit and puts them into the church. So these are all very consistent themes that are we're that the way you bring uh, order out of chaos is you establish purpose. And then when you build that thing, you now have something you have to have maintain. We built our house 25 years ago. I thought the work was over. Uh-uh. <laughs> right? It, there's right. more work. And so every time you bring order out of chaos, you create a new thing, which itself will become disordered again 
you mentioned it earlier, the laws of entropy, my house, unless I maintain it, will fall down. So the, all of this stuff is revealed in Scripture. And the, the backdrop of the book is it, the more you understand this, the better leader you will be. I'm, I'm a business person, so I don't talk about these things for theory reasons. I talk about them as to why do people do what they do and what am I facing if I'm trying to form purpose and get people to work together. I've got to understand the chemistry of human mind and heart. What is, what is it that makes us do what we do? Right. Okay. All right. Well, let's go into the business side then. Um, so let, let's, whether I am a, uh, a manager of any kind or an entrepreneur, you know, running the company and, and therefore by in part manager as well. Um, as a manager, I'm just, I'm just going to say in America, and I'm sure it's similar yeah. elsewhere. You normally have too much on your plate, too mm -hmm. much to do. Not time to do it. You're trying to get things off your list. That's why we have, you know, type A people who will write something down on a list just to be able to check it off the list. Um, and so if I'm trying to, I'm trying to work through getting this done, getting that done, getting that done. And then the frustration that comes afterward when we put that in place and it's no longer working. You think of a, an incentive plan. And so mm -hmm. we put an incentive plan in place for sales, for salespeople or, or someone to go produce. And you know, it's good. It's what they wanted today, but two years from now, it has created enough bad habits. And now we've, we have to redo it. Mm -hmm. So when I'm thinking about from a business perspective, the, this decay there, that happens everywhere. That's right. And it mean, as a leader, it means uh, a principle you have to understand is anytime you build something new, like the, an incentive system, you say you put that together you have to monitor it and say at some point it needs to, it's decayed. It's, it's no longer servicing, serving the purpose of, for which it was tended and intended. And when that happens, you either try to fix it or you get rid of it. And one of the, one of the best lessons I ever had in management was um, I went to Yellowstone Park with my family when they were young. And we were just chatting with a park ranger and he, he was talking about the history in Yellowstone. He said that around the turn of the 20th century, uh, Teddy Roosevelt and some of the naturalists, they really got on a um, prevent forest fires and trying to preserve our natural lands. And he, he said, we finally figured out after many years, it was better to let them burn. And then he showed us an area that was, he said, that burned completely to the ground about 20 years ago, and it was just lush and rich with growth. And, uh, you know, a leadership lesson is to recognize that when you create something, it won't stay the same. It, it will either get better or it will degrade. And um, if it degrades, you have to be willing to have the courage to stop it or replace it. And most people don't want to stop things once they've created it. Right. Yeah. Well, okay. So, so speak to those managers or to someone who's, who is trying to hold to tradition. This is the way we've done this. This is speak to them right now. How, how do, how do they reconcile that and understand that this is part of God's design here, I think is, is a huge part of that, but yeah. How, how do they reconcile that and decide is this, that is this a flawed design well, and, for, or is it decaying? The first rule of get, getting control of chaos or things that are just not working is to stop and uh, reaffirm or, re, or check purpose. Say purpose, it, it's really hard work to get purpose right. People like to, the, people write books about what is your purpose. And, and it's always simplistic like you have one purpose you don't hmm. and and so part of forming a purpose is to know whether that purpose aligns with the purposes that you don't control so think at the strategy level for an organization i love making yo-yos and um so i create an organization to make yo-yos well what if the market doesn't want yo-yos then I had a purpose for that organization, but that purpose did not align with the purpose of the market. And so this, uh, this simplicity of figure out your purpose is, is not doing anybody any good because 
there is way more than one purpose and your purpose has to align with other purposes. You get married, you better start readjusting your purposes to what are our collective purposes. Right. And uh, what, you know, what this leads to, this is where the, uh, your theology matters is if you, if you start checking your purposes and say, well, okay, I work for my boss. Is my purpose aligned with his purpose? Now, is his boss's purpose aligned with the organization's purpose? You may be working for somebody that's marching in the wrong direction within an organization that has a good purpose. Bear with me here. And so that, so even at the company level, that purpose has to align with the society you're in. Does the market, does the laws of the land. And if you violate those bigger purposes, well, this leads to the question, if you keep going up through this, this, chain of purposes, where do you end up? You you end up, okay, there's a federal government. What's above the federal government? Then there's a, a world government, perhaps, or, you know, the, the prophecy says that we will eventually have a world government. Well, what's right. above the world government? And what, what you quickly conclude, if you think this through, if you believe there's a God, and I'm not criticizing people that don't. There were years that I didn't either. But if you believe there's a God, then like Monet, that God will decide what's good and what's not. He's the creator, just like Monet was. And I can vote against it. I can jump up and down and scream or whatever. Monet destroyed his paintings because they did not satisfy his design. God has told us what satisfies his design. He says, you tell the truth. You love your neighbor. You don't have to be greedy. All right. the, he's told us how he's designed this universe, and you can reject it or not. And the beauty of this universe is you get to make free choices. You do not get to choose the consequences of those choices. Right, right. I can Absolutely. jump off a building. I cannot choose. I can say there's no God, but you cannot choose what happens. And so back to the, the chaos in a local department. If there's chaos in that department, you okay? Yeah, we'll, uh, sorry, I forgot to, my camera shuts off and then oh. it's shut back on okay. uh, after 30 minutes. So we'll, we'll just start that sentence right over again. So you're saying back to the local. Yeah, if there's chaos in a local department, I guarantee you 90% of it is rooted in not either the purpose isn't right or the strategy to follow the purpose is not right. And um, so this word, where does it break down in the strategy to follow the purpose? One, you don't have the right people in the right spot, or you're trying to ask them to do more than they can do, which means the purpose isn't right. If I ask you to do, a hundred things and you can only do 50, then I've given you a purpose that's failed, yeah. that, can, that cannot succeed. And so, I, hey, I, this doesn't make this struggle go away. I get, I wake This morning, I woke up and I prayed, God, I got more to do today than I can possibly do. What do I do? Where do I spend my time? I do this every day. I'm like everyone else. Um, I'm only, I'm older. And, uh, and I always have more to do than I can think. And then I just drop back, get out the Bible, read and think, what really, what am I, what am I trying to get done? Well, who am I? What am I doing? And I re rehearse that and then gradually say, well, that's not quite as important. And that's not quite as important. <laughs> so long answer. Sorry. No, 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 it's okay. I, I, I uh, there's just so many circumstances where I want, I want to go back again. Just say things is important. Will you, will you please d define chaos again, again here for us? Well, the way we're using the word chaos is it, it's raw material from which you can, you can apply to purpose. And so I'm not saying that we don't do things that don't create chaos. Uh, so, you know, there, there's types of chaos that are self-inflicted. But in general, the world has way more resource than we know what to do with. And we get, we've got way more choices. What jobs do I take? Or within a job, which project do I work on? You've got 10 you could do. And if you don't decide, you will have chaos because you'll try to do all of them. And then none of them will work. 
And that's why I keep saying there's this purpose and chaos are really almost two sides of the same coin. If you, uh, I, when they built my house here, they, they had loads of lumber and it looked like chaos to me, all kinds of materials scattered all over the place on the building lot. And then a guy walks up to the blueprint and all of a sudden, you know, okay, take this two before and put it here. Yep. That's the way your life is. God has created such an abundance in our life. You can do a million different things with your life. You can read a million different books tomorrow. On and on and on, the resources are abundant. But without purpose, you will just be overwhelmed by them. Okay. So Uh, let me go back to to COVID. Uh, We had a client in COVID in Chicago where they had their, uh, they're providing health care and um, their systems were all overwhelmed overnight, three, four times the volume. And uh, in one meeting I was in before writing the book, it affected me selecting this title. I said, in the next 90 days, what do you need to get done? And the answer around the table is, we just need time to think. Of all the things they could have picked. Mm. And they were so busy change, chasing the symptoms and the overload that they had no time to recalculate what their purpose was, to rethink. Because they have to change their purpose in the midst of a pandemic. You have to change what your objective is. Right. You have to drop a whole bunch of things, and you have to focus on a few things. But they didn't even have time. To, or at least they were not taking the time to they they were so busy answering the phone that they didn't bother to re could not bother to recalculate how they were going to do this and they lived in chaos for months because they refused to make this the hard choices of changing yeah. what they were doing so so as an entrepreneur um I, I think I think when you talk about this and we talk about purpose here and and, and the way that God has gifted us chaos. Um, I, I I think you know parenting probably th- this applies to parenting. I would mm-hmm. assume, but but it doesn't seem to jump out any more to me. And maybe it's just because my kids are younger. There's a different level of chaos. It's it's a it's a manageable chaos here where it's gets different when these are bigger emotional decisions of of you know young adults and adults. Um, and I understand that parenting gets even you know much heavier. Um, but I'm thinking back to the entrepreneur side of this, that when you go into business here and you've obviously got experience with this, it's it, it like it is a it is honestly you're, and you're changing my perspective. It is a beautiful gift of chaos, and I, and I and I you know I keep trying to to engineer it back to you know put provide my engineering controls to get this back into control, and I'm mm-hmm. not in control. Yeah. I'm not in control, and I, I'm constantly aware that of, of how not in control I am. I can't control the market. I can't yeah. control what other people do. There's so many things. You know, I can't control an underwriting decision. So I'm not in control, but I'm trying to engineer control into this. Yes. And to me, I, I was wrestling that saying, maybe I am you know, not depending on God enough, but if, if I, what I'm trying to do is actually I'm trying to bring order to chaos, and that's my purpose, that, that gives me a whole new perspective into, into the entrepreneurial journey. Yeah, if you if you marry that, I'm same same way as you. And if you marry that truth, what you just said, with the idea that I can't control all the chaos. God, God, when He created the universe, only used a small part of it to create this earth. He, and, and so, the chaos you'll never, if you just think in general about changing the world or or all the chaos, uh, you only do it by picking something to focus on. We're we're not God. We we have to narrow our focus and work on something. Now, God can redirect us and lead us, but he usually leads us as we obey him in some small area, and then he'll give us better vision for it. And uh, what I see the mistake, two mistakes that happen in the business world all the time is they make uh, the purpose too large, more than they can handle, and in the process of trying to lift that impossible scope, they end up not doing anything well. Right. That's one mistake um, that 
that people consistently make. The, the second one is rooted in <clears throat> the idea that um, your actions have to have integrity to the purpose. <laughs> now, so remember that for, for, for a box model, desire, intent, or uh, mind or reason, imagination or intention and action. Many times people don't want the discipline that it takes to execute against the purpose they have. So um, an example is fitness. It, is it a good purpose to want to be fit? Absolutely. Take the next step. Do I know how to do that? Drink more water, exercise more, eat less, you know, eat right. I know how to do that. Where does this break down? In, you know, if you look in the order of this, some things break down at the at the desire level. I want something that's wrong, mm -hmm. something that does not align with the world. I want to build yo-yos, and the world doesn't want yo-yos. That's a desire problem. I want to build iPhones, and I do a good design. People want that. But guess what? If you don't put the right materials in an iPhone or you don't assemble it right, it won't work. And so a leader has to be able to diagnose when something's not working is this a desire problem? Are we headed in the wrong direction? Or is it a discipline problem or a design problem? We're not trying to do it in the right way. Or is it a, a um, human nature? I'm bored with doing this right, so I'm not going to do it right. And uh, in my life, I've, I can point, to, I've learned after all this time to diagnose fairly quickly. I, I can say, okay, this is a discipline problem. I don't really want to do, I know how to do this, but I don't want to do it. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. And so when you run into uh, just practical tips for a leader supervising, when you run into, um, we see this a lot in clients, they have a department or whatever where people are angry and they're hard to work with. And they, an individual may be really bitter or um, just confrontational all the time. Th the temptation to interact with that person as a leader is to get aggressive and uh, to challenge them to change their behavior. And I'm not saying that's all wrong, but a wise leader will realize there's some desire behind that. There's something causing that symptomatic behavior because every single person on earth, if you believe the Bible, if you if you're, uh, believe we're creating God's image, that most disgruntled employee is has a desire that's not being filled. They want to win and they don't know how. Now, they may not even know why they're feeling the way they are. You know, you've seen a child, an infant child who starts to get grumpy when they need to go to sleep, but they don't want to go to sleep. It's the same way with an adult. We're wired to win. And when we don't win, we start expressing it in all kinds of ways and may not even connect to it. Well, a wise leader will help a person who's really a pain in the rear they will work on helping that person get to the root cause of it. It could be something at home. It could be they don't feel like they're in the right work. You don't know. But if you care about them, you spend a little more time with them to try to help them figure that out and quit attacking the symptoms. If you attack the symptoms, you just escalate the problem. Okay. <laughs> I, okay. I, I, I think, yeah, no, this is, this is really good. I think we're going to... We're going to pick this up again here on on the next episode, and because because this just applies to to everything, because everything in life here comes down to relationships, and also you know the the harder one here is self reflection, because maybe there are some areas that uh, you know it's easy for me to talk about an employee or or a child or a, you know a spouse, you know, and and the way that they're yeah, decaying, you know, that, you know where, where 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 is the problem with them? But but uh, I think that we can keep leaning into this here to change our perspective. And again, as we talk about this, like life is not supposed to be easy. And so if we quit wanting easy and we just want what God wants for our lives, um, that's a huge piece. But then bringing a, a different perspective, you know, looking at difficulty through a different lens here is going to help. But I, I want to lean into the, I want to lean into this more of, of these, these four, um, the, the four I guess, quadrants or the, the boxes that you're calling them there um, to how to diagnose that because mm -hmm. it's different you know, say, you know we, we have really great 
tools out there from a personality profile standpoint and other things to, to figure out um, you know, how to work with a certain type of person. But that doesn't talk about how to work with a person who started when things were good. The apple was fresh and it was good and it was delicious, but over time it decayed. Yeah. And and you know chaos got reintroduced here. Um, that how do we how do we connect there, diagnose, and then try to bring order back into that situation? I want to I want to lean into your experience there. So uh, we are going to pick that up next week. Um, to listeners here, I hope you'll tune in with us again on the on that one here. But Gary, thank you for for joining us. Uh, before before we go here, so um, the the book is called Built to Be Chaos. It's um, and and Gary, how, how do how do people find you or connect with you? Oh, sure. My our website is leadfirst.ai or uh, Amazon. The books on that, and uh, you know the subtitle of the book is really what it's all about. It, it, you know, it says built to be chaos, but um, biblical wisdom for leading yourself and others. And this yeah. is really a leadership book, but there's some things you got to know about how God created the the universe. To, to do that, yeah, right? To dig into, yeah, again, way easier to lead others than than to lead yourself. Put the mirror up and 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 yeah. do that kind of self reflection. So, so we're gonna we're gonna dig into that next week. Um, okay. So, thanks for listening. We'll talk to you again. Thank you again for listening to Wealth Well Done. Be sure to subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast player, and together we'll continue to improve our relationship with money and our effectiveness in stewarding it well.